And I'm Darren Drawlinger with ASABE. Uh, it is uh, certainly my privilege to uh, introduce uh, our luncheon speaker. Uh, Dr. Schieffer is a professor and chair in business management, organization, and information management in the Department of Food and Resource Economics at the University of Bonn in Bonn, Germany. He's the director of the Bonn International Center for Food Chain and Network Research, or FoodNet Center. Dr. Schieffer is the chairman of the board of the university's experimental stations and is also the chairman of the International Center for Management, Communication, and Research. His research interests include quality and environmental management, process control and enterprises, and agri-food supply chains process management, food chain transparency, trust, strategic control, and sustainability. So with that, please help me, Dr. Dr. Schieffer. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. You know now already my background, it's agriculture economics, and I don't really fit into this uh, group here. So my view is completely different. Let's see how it fits with what you are doing. I am very happy about the opportunity to be here, and I have learned a lot during this morning. And I must really uh, confess, if I had known all those things that had been presented this morning, my presentation would have been different. So it would have been improved, and uh, so what, what to do? I think we just have to live with it as it is at the moment. Very quickly, where do I come from? I come from a very distant continent called Europe. You see there it's yellow, and in the middle of Europe there's a small city called Bonn. It has about 300,000 inhabitants, but it's very proud because it's very old. It's about 2,000 year, years old. It has been established by the Romans, so I'm very proud of it. And we're also proud because we are very engaged in music. And Beethoven was born in Bonn, and we will have a big celebration in some years' time the Beethoven celebration in Europe. And you see it's a beautiful place, it's uh, close to the Rhine River, beautiful landscape, has wine there, so whenever you visit Europe, go there, I think you will appreciate it. But now let's go to the problems. I think we all know that, um, and this morning has been a lot of uh, discussions around these problems we are dealing with in a sector which is very unstable. And many of those things have been touched. You see demographics, changes in diets, growing population, urbanization, etc., etc., etc. So I say, so what? Many sectors have problems. The car sector has problems. Everywhere there are problems. Why do we focus so much on the food sector? And the key issue is that the food sector is different. I think there are only two sectors that are different from the rest of the, from the economic sectors. It's the health sector and the food sector. We cannot be without them. And those sectors are not just economic sectors where you earn money, you run your operations, but they have responsibilities, which is a very strange issue to, uh, to put responsibilities on people and in companies. So what are the responsibilities? There are two issues, and we have been dis uh, discussing them this morning as well. One of them is they have to feed the world. They have to provide food. If they want to or not, they have they have to provide food. It's not like a car company which has to provide cars. No, 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 no. But in food sector, it's different. They have to. And the second one, that they have to respect the, what we say is the economic, environmental, and social needs of the society. Let's look first at the first part. Sometimes people summarize it under, under the word food security. And there are two statements in the world. The first statement, I loved it very much. It came, it is the main objective that has also been formulated by the University of Wageningen in the Netherlands. We have to produce twice with half. Very nice. And then other people say, no, we have enough. A third of our population is obese. And a third of the population has too little. So just distribute it accordingly. So that's fine. And for the growing population, we just have to get rid of the waste. You see, and in between, that's where we're working. So none of them is really true in itself, but both uh, together are what we are, think we are looking uh, uh, to in the future. 
Now, when we look at the second part, which is more, I think, the theme of this morning, when we talk about the society and some consumers, you know maybe that the European Union has a strategy which they call Strategy 2020, and it says decouple economic growth from the use of resources. And everything we have been discussing has been uh, formally the low carbon economy, renewable energy, et cetera, et cetera. But then come the consumers in. And I don't, I've never heard about similar issues here in America, but there are now very high pressures in some of those retailers in Europe to fit consumer demands. And one of them, I've taken just an example of one of the major European re retailers which tries to promote a kind of a general brand. They call it ProPlanet. And this brand is for the mass market. So it's not for the niche market. And what they do is that they evaluate each range of the supply chain and say, OK, is it sustainable, yes or no? And you see all those different kind of indicators that have there, talk about energy, water, land use, waste. And then they calculate an overall index. And then if the overall index is above a certain threshold, they say, OK, now you are eligible for being called a pro-planet product. Now it's moving further. Producer like Barilla, I've taken the example of Barilla, is playing the same game. They've developed an index for their own products where they put in water footprint, carbon footprint, ecological, ecological footprint, and other issues. And they want to promote this. You see, that's a pressure from the consumer side that is coming in. Now, when we look at the picture, uh, we like to draw the picture like this. We saw resources go down, problems and needs go up. So we're, that's our problem, is it? And then I was participating about three, four weeks ago in a conference in South Africa of the International Food and Agribusiness Management Association. And then the African people said, that's typical European this kind of depressing view, that's our view. It's completely different. We don't live in problems and needs. We live in an age of opportunities. You have to have this kind of opportunistic view. There is a lot of things to do and to deal with. And then I thought maybe I'd change my presentation here for this group and say, let's talk about the opportunities. Let's pick up this kind of optimistic view. And then I say, OK, take the age of opportunities. And they say, we have power in our hands. We are very powerful. And first, let me start with a kind of an overview. This is a picture, a very rough picture of a food chain. So the farms are in there. That's fine. But farms are just a part. And I think I take one of the statements of the former assistant general of FAO, which said it was one of our major mistakes in our society that they uh, separated agriculture from the food system. So people are talking about agriculture, that's one group of people, and then other people are talking about food industry and consumers. And such so not fitting. All of those who work now in sustainability or in quality, they know it's not fitting because we are one. And the discussions we had on life cycle assessment just tries to bridge this gap and bring those two groups together. Now, when I said power in our hands, I would like uh, to uh, mention three elements. First of it, it's technology we have in our hands. Second, it's knowledge. Just taking an example of uh, uh, a life cycle assessment of CO2. And then we have people. These two major issues I would like to very quickly mention. Because they support us in doing analysis, they support us when we take the three, in identifying opportunities, and they support us in running actions. Technology, I think we all know. Digital technology, big thing. Some people say it's the biggest thing ever. And what's going on there? You see that computing power is growing tremendously when you look to the future. So what's about that? We are not looking into the past. We are looking to the future. Mobile devices growing tremendously. So what's behind it? And then we are talking about things like the future internet, and it has been shown, at least in some of the presentations, things that are happening in communication. We talk about improvements in transparency, in trust. It was one of the issues in the last presentation. And the European Union is at the present running an 80 million euro program just for the food industry to improve transparency along the chain. It's a 
kind of a future internet program which altogether has about 300 million euro. As you see, it's a tremendous investment that's going on there. We are involved in that. It involves farms, industry, and consumers, focusing on transparency and trust. Now, the second issue I would like to mention is the knowledge, knowledge growth. It has been mentioned, I think, in the introductory speech this morning that Malthus has been had a very, very depressive view on the future in the past. You know, it never happened. And what was it? It says, okay, it's because we gained more knowledge. And now, uh, I like this uh, uh, slide here, because everybody is complaining about all those people that come on, onto the earth. Nine, people we have to, nine billion people we have to feed. Nine billion. But what it means when it comes to talents? And that I like. This is this kind of picture that shows many, many more people, many, many highly educated people live in the world. And that's a talent. That's a talent to be used. It's not just people who have to feed. And now look at those things. People have started to use this talent. Is this kind of using the many, as I call it. We talk about open innovation. I think you've heard about this. Industry is jumping much, much more now in, in, in uh, in the present on open innovation. We talk about swarm intelligence. We talk about open source. We talk about wiki science, etc., etc. You see now that we take this talent of this increase of people, educated people, to make something out of it. Just an example, I think you know, open source biotech is one of those wiki issues. Another one which I like very much is the Global Food Security Index that has been developed by the economic, uh, Economist Economic Unit. It's being promoted also by Depot. It has about 100 variables in it, and it's a beautiful base for identifying where should we do what. It's just now a global picture, uh, because it's a global index, but the global index can be cut down in many, many, many sub-indices. So very interested to look at. It looks at affordability, availability, and the quality and safety of food. Now let's go to the last part, people. It struck me when people were discussing about sustainability in Africa and said, you are always talking about economics, you talk about environmental issues and social, but where are people? People is the most important issue. I come now from a country, which we call a developed countries, where we don't really discuss so much about people, and maybe in America it's the same. But those people coming from countries or continents like Africa say, that's our main issue, people. So we say sustainability starts with educating people, getting them in there. And I picked now up on this example of Africa. It has been discussed this morning already. You have two different types of views. You have the pessimistic view. It's the upper one, the gray one, which says we will have so many more people in some years, 300 million more people reaching labor age. What can we do? Unemployment, people will migrate to cities or whatsoever. Problem, problem, problem. On the other side, there are big, big opportunities. You need to keep these people in the production area. But you have to make sure they are being educated. You have to make sure that they are being attracted to farming and to agriculture. And then they say Africa is able to feed the world. Because why? Why do we need the people there? And I think it's similar in Asian, Asian countries, some of them were discussing also this morning, because there is a low productivity, a huge potential in developing productivity, a huge potential in land resource. It has been mentioned, the land acquisition that is going on there from different continents all over Africa. So it is there, but we need the people. Just an example, our own experience about the past. You see here, I had just taken a picture out of Canada that were what have been gained in productivity gains over the last uh, years or 20, 30 years. Less cows, but the same production of milk. Now, how, what can be done in, in uh, countries law on continents like Asia and Africa? I take now an example that was brought forward by Novos. You see the large farms on the top that produce about 10 tons per hectare. And then there's a large group of what we call uh, subsistence farmers. And then the question is, can we move them to commercial farming? Move from a 0 0.5 yield per hectare to 5, not 10 to the big ones. No, 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 to 5, which would mean a 10 times increase 
in production. You need improvement in technology, you have to provide them with seed fertilizer, but also you have to keep people there and make sure that they are educated and attracted to agriculture. That's just this novus project I mentioned there, where they use smartphones to communicate uh, with farmers, make it also attractive, new technology is being used, so it's what they call sexy to young people to be there in farming, so that they were moving from problems to opportunity. So they've started with Kenya, and now they move into Nigeria. Similar project are known from Vietnam and other, other parts of the world. So two challenges. Number one challenge, keep young people in agriculture. And that, uh, I like this, it was a, a statement of a young student which says, you have the completely wrong image. You always put this poor farmer, it's a picture, the poor, uh, poorly fed farmer uh, looking very sad. That's not a picture. You need something glamorous, technology, interesting, keep people there. And the other one that you say, okay, you have to push technology in, something we did over the last 100 years, you have pushed there within the next 10 years. But we have power, we have the digital age, we have information technology, how to use the power to speed things up. Let me now look at some few individual examples, some of them have mentioned this morning as well, but still I try to put them forward. There has been discussion this morning on water footprint, which is um, yeah, counting all the water that is a product in there. And the other um, uh, um, slide or, or graph shows the scarcity. And you see there, the red ones are the area in the world where there is not enough water. And then you look at the lower one, what we are doing in Europe. We are importing water and water because we love to get water from them else. We have enough water. We don't care, but we trade water with all the products we import. So we talk about trade in virtual water, and that's one of the major problems when we talk about distribution of water. We take water from the United States. You see, United States has dry areas, but we, and the United States is one of the major imp, uh, exporters of water also to Europe. And the situation will be worse. The red parts means worsening of the situation in the coming years. So what do we have to do? We have to reconsider trade relationships, number one. Number two, we have to reconsider production opportunities in the organization of production in the different worlds, parts of the world. I had initially here some slides which showed some of the very, very uh, depressive picture of parts of Spain which are uh, exporting fruits and vegetables to Germany very dry areas, irrigated ones, and then putting all those water up to this very wet country called Germany. Now, some uh, uh, words to, when it comes to climate, and I focus on the issue carbon footprint. We all know food is bad, carbon footprint. It's the left part. We all know beef is bad. That's the right part. So it doesn't look very good. But I think we all know that we make progress during the last years, 10, 20 years. For example, when we look at carbon footprint and milk production, okay, we have increased the productivity and the carbon footprint per unit of milk has decreased. But we have to link production with consumption. And I think that has been mentioned also several times and it's one of the big, big issues. And I like this picture, it has been developed by Barilla. And to the left side, you see um, uh, this kind of pyramid which talks about eating. So what is the, um, uh, the way people should eat? You see the green part, the low part, is the good things for eating. Fresh fruit, vegetables, what is there? Pasta, of course, of course it's Italy, pasta, it's all over there. Oils, and then on the top you have meat. So your uh, daily diet should have little meat and a lot of, of those green stuff. And on the right side, you have the production part, the ecological footprint, and that means the negative impact on the environment. And you see that the low part, the green part, has a very little negative impact on the environment, and the red part, the meat, has a very negative impact on the environment. So, bring those things together. What is good for people is good for the environment, so it fits. I think getting these health issues together with the production issues 
Now the question is how to get it out. Barilla has developed now an index, which they call Barilla Index, where they put all those water footprint, carbon footprint, ecological footprints together. But then it's a question of how to get it out. And now there are discussions going on also in our future internet project, how to use smartphones and all those technologies to communicate with uh, consumers also at retail stages. So that means they communicate with products, they get feedback, they get a red light, they get a green light or whatsoever. So we are playing around with it. We are moving to a new age where things might change considerably. I like this kind of old examples when we said, what did engineers when we talk about the past, when they look at carriages and horses, they would have improved the carriages all over and improved uh, the breed of horses to get better and better. No, we invented the cars. And I think we're at the moment at this, what we call age of opportunities, where things might change considerably. It's not just a kind of continuing from the past and just improving. I also like this here. Um, you know, the chemical industry is working very hard, and uh, there are things going on there that we will be happy to have CO2 in the future because we might gain money off, out of it. And it was one of the major dairy companies in the Netherlands which told me such just four weeks ago said that, that we are betting on it because that will be one of our issues for future farming, that CO2 will be an output and we will be able to sell it as a basic for the, chemical in, for the chemical industry. And if you go into the internet, you will see I put it down at the lower part that there are some very exciting developments at the moment where things seem to become economically viable. There are other things going on which are sometimes a little bit fun, like Astas, which, uh, who store apple in caves, going back to the old Stone Age. But anyhow, ideas are there. But uh, one of the key issues, and that's the lower part, is we have to reconsider our global trade relationships. And that means we are at the stage at the moment of changing those things, getting away from global sourcing, global activities, to much more regional sourcing, regional activities, very lower carbon footprint elements. Now let me look at waste. I don't know what waste is. Everybody's talking about waste. But when I take now this example and uh, look at uh, this pyramid, and uh, I've taken now the example of the Netherlands, when we say waste is what you're getting disposed of, then it's only 4%. It's nothing. Forget about it. So the key issue is that whenever we have food, and food is being used for something else which has a lower level, then we lose some of the resources we have been used for producing food. And I think that's the issue. It's not the issue on how to use those things. For example, if you look at the lower parts, recover, recycling, treat, we have a lot of things, cradle to cradle, waste for energy. Energy. I live in a city, and this city is buying waste from all over Europe, even from Napoli. That was one of our big discussions, that we bought a lot of waste from Napoli because we want to produce energy. And our power plant needs more waste that we can produce in our own city. So that's not the problem, getting waste into energy. Uh, the problem is we have too little waste for it. Now, the key issue when we talk about loss of resources, that we go to the red part, avoid and reduce waste. And that's also some of those nice things you might have heard of those ex uh, experiments. Tesco is run in the UK, or uh, Astas, no, Astas in the UK, Tesco is from the UK, but tries in Korea, that they have billboards and subway stations. You go there with your smartphone, you order your food because you have the pictures there. You say, I oh, just want so much of this, so much of that. And then you can pick it up in the evening at some kind of collection points. Could be a retail store or somewhere in the countryside. So Astad is doing the experiments for, being, for realizing it later in the United States or Canada. But the key issue is sourcing is by order. So they source it from farms and prepare it for being sold in the evening. So no big displays where you have all this waste that is happening over the years. So there are things in the air that might change the issues. There are other, many other things uh, in there when we talk about avoid and reduce of waste. Uh, the last part I think is the most important part. Uh, the first one is more the technology, but the last part we're developing markets. It has been mentioned all of this morning, we need to develop markets for products that are not standardized, or we have developed standards 
for products that are non-standard at the moment, because that's part of the big waste that is happening in the, in, in the agricultural part. And uh, I think the European Union is not a good example for this. I think somebody has been mentioning uh, cucumbers and or bananas or whatever, uh, which is not good. Maybe some words to urbanization. You see the blue line is uh, the percentage of population that is living in big cities and urban concentrations. And that's now a picture of all those mega cities we expect in the future. We already have some of them that have more than 10 billion inhabitants. You see many, many, a lot of them are in Asia, South America, Africa, some few in Europe. So a big thing is there. We are not yet really prepared to deal with it. And one of the things out there uh, that has been uh, put forward also is urban agriculture. Sometimes the feeling people are looking at is a kind of a niche issue. It's not a niche issue. It's something that's moving into mainstream. And I don't know uh, to what extent agricultural engineers are engaged in this, having a proper production method, having a proper distribution schemes, and getting them into those major value chains in there. Vertical agriculture is developing. I put here the name of Plandagon because it was one of those companies which got a lot of prizes here in the United States. They wanted to build a high rise in a, in a very cold city in Sweden. And that in the south part we have agriculture, in the north part of the building we have business offices. And the high rise was, uh, could be paid with the business offices. So the agriculture part was an add-on. I don't know at the moment the present stage we had a discussion with them last year. And then factory agriculture, which is moving very quickly. I was just told that in Japan it's moving very quickly because of the, the disaster that they had in their atomic, uh, with their atomic issues. You see here, when you look at some of the facts, less water, less fertilizer. Energy was a problem, but they are using solar energy. What's quite interesting is that they can influence the quality of the product. Now, the key issue how to get all those different issues into the mainstream. I think that will be a, one of the major engagements we have to deal with. And it's not the, the classical agriculture, though I understand that even in my profession, people are not yet used to dealing with all those issues. But they are happening. They are happening outside of our professions. Energy, only one slide, and then I'm moving to the end of my presentation because I wanted just to communicate one sentence, that, that's the first one. We are getting away, at least my country, I think you have heard of my country, which said goodbye atomic uh, energy, which uh, said uh, hello, we moved to solar energy, even that with a lot of rain and clouds in my country, but still we have already about 30 or more than 30% of our energy is now from renewable resources, a lot of wind, but we have cut down subsidies when it comes to bioenergy from agriculture products. It's a hot discussion that's going on, and we cannot dare to continue this discussion anymore. You cannot discuss about feeding more people in the world and then at the same time take arable land and use it for energy. It's not fitting, otherwise your balance is not right. So I think what we are, have to do is moving those new directions that are developing. I've just mentioned some of them that you use land that is not really suitable for uh, food products. I mentioned here miscanthus trees and whatever. We are very engaged now university in such productions. Byproducts, I love the example from Brazil where they said we create more food by um, uh, utilizing byproducts for energy because then farms can farm in areas where it was not worthwhile to farm uh, uh, until, the, until today. But now they get feedback or money returns from both, from energy and from food. So they extend uh, the area where uh, agriculture is being produced. Energy from waste, we have been mentioning. Yeah, it was an, and I like this energy from algae. I think some of you have been dealing with it. Um, I don't know if we can call it belongs to our profession. I think yes. And I just saw once a kind of a, a statistic which says if you use one seventh of the corn uh, um, area of the United States, we could have the petrol for all of our petrol needs of 
the American society. So look into those things. These are innovations. Yeah? Let those innovations not bypass your own interests. So that was the age of the opportunities. And now the question is only what to do with it. It's our responsibility. Thank you very much. <laughs>